Hello everyone, I'm Mike Simmons, the founder and president of Astronomers Without Borders, and this is the third of our week of Sundays, part of the Sunday celebration during Global Astronomy Month 2015, an extension of what we have done before. We've had two uh, really interesting uh, programs so far. <clears throat> Today is another very unusual one, I think, because we're going to be talking about observing the sun, but in radio waves something we're familiar with, most people are familiar with in uh, uh, looking at radio sources in the nighttime sky, but the, looking at the sun in radio waves is something we haven't heard much about. So we're lucky to have with us now uh, Dale Gary, who is the uh, a professor of physics at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and uh, he is working on what is known as the Extended Owens Valley uh, solar Array, and he uh, joins us from his office at the New Jersey Institute of Technology that operates both this array and the Big Bear Solar Observatory. So, so welcome, Dale. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. And I think uh, because I'm operating these uh, m myself this time instead of having a producer, I think I may have had you up on the screen while I was introducing myself, but uh, but that's okay. You're the guest of interest here and not me. So <laughs> there we are. So, you know, let's start by talking about what this is about. You know, we're used to looking at the sun, obviously, in visual wavelengths, infrared, uh, ultraviolet from satellites and so on. But this seems unusual to most people to be looking at the sun in radio waves. So has this been done before? Is this something new? Uh, and, and why do we want to look at radio waves? Oh, actually, uh, you know, the sun was one of the first objects to be looked at in radio. Um, the, the actually the first uh, objects were it was the center of the galaxy, which was uh, done by Carl Jansky way back in the 30s. But during World War II, uh, people started noticing with their radar systems that something in the sky was causing a problem on occasion. And in fact, during that time, it was discovered to be the sun. Hmm. So one interesting thing was after World War II, a number of groups, in, especially in England and Australia, uh, took a lot of surplus equipment from the radar systems of World War II and turned them to looking at the sun. And so uh, uh, some of the first discoveries really of the radio sky uh, were of the sun. Okay, well, and here of course, we have an example of looking uh, at listening to the radio sky, in this case, Jodie Foster in, in contact, uh, listening to the, the radio waves coming from the, uh, the very large array in New Mexico. I don't think this really represents what's going on here, though, does it? <laughs> no, I think in the popular media, it's, it's quite often that uh, radio astronomers are depicted as having earphones, like I do now. But in fact, <laughs> I can safely say that uh, I never use earphones during my uh, professional work. Right. Uh, no, in, instead, we are, uh, we are uh, basically looking at variable voltages that are uh, produced at the sun and travel all the way through space to Earth and arriving at the speed of light and those variable voltages are then detected at the uh, radio telescopes. We record them, we correlate them, uh, look at the uh, spatial and uh, uh, spectral and temporal variations in them and that's what we study. That's where the physics is in, in studying those variations. So variations in voltages coming from the sun. <laughs> and, and it's exactly the way your uh, your uh, you know, radio antenna on your car works. So there are voltages that are varying at the source at the radio station. They go at the speed of light through the through the uh, air, and they arrive at your antenna and produce little voltages in your antenna, and that's what's recorded by or you know uh, looked at by your uh, radio receiver. So. We, but uh, one other difference is that when the signal reaches the antenna it's creating voltage it doesn't necessarily create sound and it seems to me that uh, popular media shows radio waves and sound as being the same thing and radio waves are used to modulate the sound and to send it someplace but exactly. it's not the radio waves itself so you wouldn't be listening with those those uh, headphones on to the voltages either 
Exactly. Yeah, we have to uh, record them with high-speed uh, computers and uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, study those records. So, and, and here is a picture taken from the Owens Valley. It's part of what gets used. It is not uh, the primary instrument, but uh, these are uh, dishes. I've seen these dishes driving up the Owens Valley you know, for many years. Uh, these aren't pointed at the sun, but, but how are these used first? Um, so I just want to point out the little white dots in between them are the, are the array, actually. So it's so one those, here and over here. Yeah. Uh -huh. So those are the solar dishes. And for the sun, uh, the reason you have big dishes is for collecting areas so that you can collect a lot of radiation and, and see very faint things. But, of course, the sun is not faint at all. And so we can get just as much information by using small dishes as we could with the big ones. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, if we use the big ones to point at the sun, then we have to put a lot of attenuation in to cut down the signal. Otherwise, it's much too bright. So uh, the little ones are fine for the sun, but the big ones are needed for calibration. So in order to look at the fainter sources that are really the centers of active galaxies, these quasars, uh, we use those to, as point sources to uh, do the calibration. Right, right. And so uh, this is equivalent to what we do uh, at Mount Wilson. I use the solar telescope there for educational programs and so on. It's very much smaller than the big telescopes used at nighttime. And as it is, even at uh, 24 inches, it produces an awful lot of energy. So exactly. it's the same thing in radio. There's plenty of radio coming out there. It's right. quite bright in radio as well. And, and here, now, <clears throat> this is a picture of the smaller dishes closer up. Um, right. They look like ordinary radio dishes, a little bit bigger than what somebody might use to get direct TV on the top of their house. But, uh, yep. yeah, is That's there? That's right. Mm -hmm. But you see that uh, at the focus of the uh, telescopes is a lot of um, uh, what looks like a lot of wires. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the main... Uh, thing about these receivers, those are the receivers there, and you can see a little um, kind of a pointy thing pointing at the center of the dish. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the feed. And this feed actually has wires of different lengths that are responding to wavelengths of different lengths. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a very broadband receiver system. It actually can receive uh, information between 1 and 18 gigahertz. So that's a, a very broad range of frequencies. And then we, the, the main thing about this system is that we are able to tune to bands within that broad range very, very quickly. So we sample the entire spectrum from one to 18 gigahertz in one second. Mm -hmm. And, that's, and needed, that... that's needed because of the solar flares that occur at very, very fast time scales. So we want to be able to resolve that. So scanning the spectrum there is equivalent to uh, looking at all the colors in a solar spectrum, a visual spectrum, everything from red to blue, but looking at them in detail very, very quickly. That's right. Yeah. Well, so. But you'll notice that there's not just one dish. We could do that with one dish, mm -hmm. but we have uh, actually 13 of these dishes. If you want to go back to that uh, previous picture mm -hmm. um, in the background, Wait for it to come up here. Is it there? Um, so I don't know if you can see in the in the very distant background. There's one little dot. Um, right yeah, right there. That's our most distant antenna. That's antenna 13 out of the 13. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these these dishes are scattered over a very wide area, and we do interferometry with them, which is to say we combine their signals to turn them into as if they were one single big dish of that size, of mm -hmm. the size of the distance between them. Right. And, and so this is uh, similar to what we had uh, with the very large array um, it, that Jody Foster was photographed at, even though that's not what they use for SETI. Uh, and there's no reason to do interferometry for that particular purpose, but interferometry will allow you then to get very uh, much uh, smaller details on the surface of the sun. Exactly. Uh, so we yeah. can actually make images of the sun. Okay. 
what, what kind of a pattern are these arrayed in? Clearly, they're sort of scattered um, here and there. They're not in a yeah, Y pattern a, or something like that. It's an interesting story. I mean, there, there are 13 antennas. So um, we actually did lay them out on a three-arm spiral. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, after we laid them out and got all ready to, to construct the instrument, um, we were told to do a cultural survey. And right in the middle of our survey turned out to be uh, some interesting uh, Native American artifacts that we were told not to disturb. <laughs> so we had to move the center part of our array uh, to uh, some distance away. Oh. Uh, so the, the, the pattern actually looks almost, you know, there's no pattern to it, <laughs> but uh, there was originally. Uh, yeah, I didn't discern one, <clears throat> but that just, that, that'll change the nature of the detail that you get. That's right. But it right. doesn't, doesn't ruin it in any way. No, no. We, we uh, you know, it's, it's not quite as optimum as we laid it out, but uh, it's, it's fine. We've done a lot of simulations, and it shows that the instrument is performing well. So. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, resolution can you get in radio then using interferometry? How small detail can we get uh, um, spatially? You, 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 there, you have a slide there of two uh, images of the full sun. Maybe you can put that up. Sure. One moment there. There we go. Okay. Right. So um, first of all, let me say that the instrument is not fully operating yet. We're still um, commissioning it, finishing up some uh, details. But this is a simulation. And you see on the left there, uh, a full disk image of the sun with the sunspots showing up as bright spots in radio. Mm -hmm. And then on the right is a simulated image of that brightness distribution after folding through the, the uh, expanded Owens Valley Array uh, uh, characteristics. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a faithful representation of what EOPSA will see. And I think you can see that we see, you know, many of the, finer details there. Certainly the sunspot regions are very clearly marked. There's a little bit of color you can see in this image, and that's actually because of the frequency dependence. Um, things that are white are over a broadband of frequencies. Things that are yellow are um, a little bit brighter at the lower frequencies. And so this is the spectral dependence that we use to, uh, to uh, study you know, the physics of what's going on. So. Right. So this is like mapping the uh, radio frequencies to the optical frequencies. So you're giving them the colors of the spectrum that we're used to seeing. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, so this is an example in terms of resolution. This is a frequency of 2.8 gigahertz. Uh, the wavelength is 10.7 centimeters. And that wavelength actually is important because uh, it's a, there, there's an index of solar activity that's used for the sun, a radio index called F10.7. And uh, that's that particular frequency. So this is an example of imaging the sun at that frequency. That index is actually the sum total of all the radiation from the sun at that frequency with no spatial resolution. So um, what EOPSA will be able to do is, is image this very important range of frequencies and be able to separate some of the contributions from the magnetic signal around the sunspots and the uh, bright loops and the background disk. So um, this resolution is um, approximately 20 arc seconds of resolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then it's a, a it scales its frequency. So when we get up to 18 gigahertz, we've got something better than two arc seconds of resolution. Right. So uh, clearly the resolution is a great deal less than what people are used to seeing in white light or H alpha images of detail. But considering that the you're talking here about 10 centimeter wavelength rather than nanometer, well, not nanometer, but uh, what uh, uh, micrometer, right. yeah, hundred the nanometer. Uh, wavelengths, it's really remarkable, um, remarkable uh, resolution that you're, you're able to get here. Right. Um, now, w tell me, for those who understand this, what's the source of the 10.7 centimeter uh, uh, radiation? 
Uh, so it comes basically from three uh, components from the sun. One is just the background uh, atmosphere, the background disk. Mm -hmm. um, one is the uh, bright loops that are uh, joining active region, you know, sunspot regions. And those bright loops uh, generate a lot of extreme ultraviolet radiation, which um, will, in fact, you might want to put up that uh, extreme ultraviolet full disk image. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. That radiation actually um, has a quite a large impact on our Earth's atmosphere. Um, it's the ionizing radiation that causes the ionosphere. So this is a picture from the Solar Dynamics Observatory of the sun in uh, extreme ultraviolet radiation. The temperatures you're seeing here, this, this material that's emitting would be around um, several hundred thousand uh, degrees Kelvin. And uh, again, all these brighter spots are regions near sunspots. So that's one uh, component of radiation that would be in that 10.7. Yeah, and, and so let me point out too that we have a very active uh, region just up here. This was grabbed uh, today just before we went on air here. And uh, everybody who's following the sun is seeing a big sunspot group right here. So this, this matches that. So this then is in the uh, lower part of the inner corona at, at that point? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. It's basically uh, from pretty near the surface and then extending up, um, you know, some hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, now, the uh, at the cores or at the foot points of these loops are where the sunspots are. And that's another important constituent of the 10.7 centimeter radiation. Uh, mm -hmm. It turns out that those those sunspots are dark in... Uh, in ultraviolet and in the optical, when you look at them, they look like black spots on the sun, but in fact, they're very bright in the radio. So uh, those were those, uh, in that earlier image, you saw the different regions of bright dots, essentially, on the, mm -hmm. on the disk, mm -hmm. and those are the magnetic signal, essentially. And of course, the magnetic field uh, strength is, is apparent from its it's a creation of uh, loops of material which follow the magnetic field lines coming out of and back into the spots in areas like this. These, these would be equivalent to the prominences we see, for example, in H alpha in the chromosphere. Uh, do these map to those? Are we seeing the same phenomenon, but in, in, uh, in a shorter wavelength there? Um, yes, basically, uh, certainly that material that you see there, that thermal material, the hot material, is um, producing radio waves. Maybe mm -hmm. I should talk a moment about how radio waves are produced. Um, electrons basically are, are uh, just vibrating electrons are what's producing the, the radiation. And, it, oh, sorry, it's the same thing that happens in your, um, in your radio. You know, you, uh, you have an oscillating voltage, which is accelerating electrons up and down, and they produce this uh, wave. And uh, you know what, Dale, let me, let me inter interrupt you for just a moment because I just realized the whole time we were looking at this image uh, because I'm not used to running these things. We had you on the screen for everybody. Uh, so they weren't able to see what it was that you and I were talking about the whole time. Okay. So to, hopefully everybody understood uh, and remembers these are the active regions. We then were, were talking about the entire disk. Uh, this was grabbed uh, this morning um, from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and the bright areas here are, again, the areas that would be producing radio waves also that you would be looking at. Is that, that right? Okay. So that's this, right. this shows that I cannot um, walk and chew gum at the same time because I can't produce these and, and talk about them at the same time and remember to click on things. So I'm very so, sorry for that. I, yeah, I, I saw them on my screen, but I guess it could still not be shown. Yeah, everybody. what what goes out to everybody is different than what you and I see on our own computers. And I'm used to having somebody else, uh, obviously more proficient right. this than I am, uh, doing that for me. So um, so I apologize to that uh, about that. So I'm sorry, you were, and you were telling us where the uh, radio waves come from in the first place. Right. The, the, these electrons, uh, essentially accelerating electrons is what produces the radio waves. So anywhere 
that electrons are moving fast and changing direction on short notice uh, will be producing radio waves. So everywhere that the sun is hot, it's producing um, radio waves from these fast electrons, which are also hot and moving about rapidly. Okay, and I have to ask you because the uh, number 10 centimeters rings a bell with some of us. Uh -huh regard to something that isn't related to the sun but is related to the same material the sun is mostly composed of which is the h2 regions in the spiral arms the 10 centimeter line was used which of course is radio waves looking out into the galaxy to map the spiral arms but the conditions are very very different there that's uh, relatively cold is there any relation to what you're looking at here or is it just a coincidence they're very close together in the spectrum um you know i the, the fact that this F10.7 uh, index was generated turns out to be a very interesting story because um, apparently there was a, a um, uh, in World War II when, this, uh, when these frequencies were developed, there was a, a, a bar of metal that could be obtained, you know, a standard size. And so people would make their magnetons out of out of magnetrons, out of um, uh, these bars of metal. And so they had a certain size, a cav the cavity that they would create to generate microwaves would have a certain size and it was 10.7 centimeters. It just happened to be that. Mm. And, uh, and then after World War II, as I said, the people started using the surplus equipment. They had, that was a natural frequency for them to use. And so that index actually began in the late 1940s and has continued today. And of course, we can't change it now because we have a historical record going all the way back. But uh, it, it turns out that that particular frequency nicely balances the contributions from the loops uh, and the sunspots. So uh, the fact that it's an excellent proxy for sunspot number and solar activity is in part because it incorporates, you know, a contribution from all the important things in the sun's uh, active cycle. So it's one of these uh, historical coincidences that kind of worked out. Yeah. We're, we're still using Fraunhofer line designations on the sun too from what the 17th century. So exactly. some of the things we're stuck with. Right. <clears throat> so, well, there, you know, there, there's a history and uh, history is interesting, I think. It is, uh, and and it's it obviously it determines where where we are now. So it's it's worth understanding. Uh, sometimes good to move on, but sometimes it's hard to do. So, um, like in the case of Pluto, for example. <laughs> that's there. Yeah. Well, we're going through the same thing with Pluto now that they went through uh, with Ceres when it was first yes. discovered. Uh, over 300 years ago and uh, people got over it then i kind of have a feeling they'll get over <laughs> it now i think so so i thought maybe we would look at this other one now this is also an sdo image let me bring that up and try not to make a mistake i think people could see the one we were looking at last time down in the lower right hand corner like they can now but uh here it's on the big screen Okay. And this is also from SDO, and this is ultraviolet. Now, we're looking at ultraviolet images, but this is very far away from what you're looking at in terms of radio. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so um, this is now a solar flare, but it's a very tiny one. Uh, and what's interesting is the tininess of it, the fact that it's um, both spatially tiny and also that it uh, produced a lot of radiation in a very short time, actually less, less than one second, the thing came and went. So um, what you're seeing is in the, in the bigger uh, uh, picture on the left, you're seeing the active region and the region where the flare occurred. And it's this little tiny thing that is then zoomed in on the middle panel. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can see that that uh, there's some some saturation. In other words, the, the loop that was had brightened in this very short period of time got so bright that it overwhelmed the camera, and the camera then uh, you know uh, the light ended up getting bled into other pixels and uh, caused this kind of vertical streak. Mm -hmm. But um, what we've done with the radio emission, the there's a little um, 
uh, arrow pointing to the vertical bar in that upper blue uh, thing on the right, uh, that, that vertical bar is showing you the time at which those, those uh, images were taken. Now these images are taken every few seconds and then between one image and the next at the same uh, wavelength takes 12 seconds. But in that 12 seconds, I don't know if you can see the time scale on that uh, blue panel, but mm. uh, you can see that that whole thing is only about uh, what, 40 seconds or so. Yeah, well, we have uh, 10 seconds from here to here, yeah. 10 seconds to here, 10 more seconds to here, 10 more seconds to here. So right. these two images are on the order of three seconds apart, something like yeah. that. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, there were no images taken right at the time of the radio emission, which is that kind of a greenish thing in the middle. Uh, you see that lasted for about 10 seconds. Um, and the nearest one is that um, 171 angstrom line. But notice that in the radio emission, uh, vertically, what's, what's shown there is the frequency variation. So. Mm -hmm. At, at the bottom part of that panel, it's low frequencies, and at the top part, it's high frequencies. And uh, there are a couple of red marks there that are showing very, very intense emission at a very narrow range of frequency. And those came and went in less than a second. So it's just interesting that the sun can produce very high energy particles. These electrons would have had to be probably in millions of electron volts, which is, uh, you know, temperatures of, um, many say a billion degrees or so <laughs> a billion a billion with a b that's right um and so that uh, that all happened in less than a second came and went and uh, cooled down again and causes this kind of slower uh glowing emission that takes place over 10 seconds okay so. so let's let's take a look at the whole blob here and try and interpret that for everybody too so what we have is about 10 seconds of this flare taking place in general but it started with sort of a medium wavelength a medium color on this on this exactly. scheme here and it's brought in more wavelengths and it seems to have intensified here and then gone away so it goes from left to right but different colors different wavelengths but in the very most powerful um uh, wavelengths we have something that lasted less than a second that popped off that could uh that it's just unimaginable uh energy uh and uh temperature right uh, that could you, you know, you don't you don't see anything like this at all in the optical. You might see a flare that lasts 10 seconds. There might be some optical component that you would see, or maybe it would take longer in H alpha, or or what would be the equivalent for this? Well, this this event, uh, you know, you can see that um, it got very bright at this one time, but it takes a while to cool off, right? So the radio emission is the very highest energy particles that are produced in the flare. And then the, the thing that you see in the extreme ultraviolet or in the optical is kind of the aftermath. The thing that's, you know, you, you light off the bomb and then it, it, uh, you see the explosion, you know, the leftover. Uh, so wow. so uh, the, the radio is really getting at that uh, very early stage uh, where the particles are, are generated initially. Okay, so it, here's a question though. The radio radio waves, radio frequency, frequencies I think of as low energy. Each one of the photons carries less energy than what we're used to seeing in optical and especially ultraviolet and so on. But you're talking about apparently the vast majority of the energy of these flares being emitted and carried away in radio frequencies. Now, uh, I, I want to, the, the electrons have very high energy and they're producing these frequency radio uh, so, so but the radiation itself is not carrying very much energy those okay. same electrons will move from where they're generated down to the surface and when they hit the surface they will stop and generate x-rays so that's the link between the radio and the x-rays it's the same electrons are producing them but um the radio emission is when they're accelerated the um the uh, x-ray emission is when they die essentially Okay, so what, what is happening is the electrons are 
carrying this enormous energy. Right. And we see them when they crash into something and there's a flash of radio and of X-ray. So but the, the but the radio is produced before they crash. Before they okay. crash. That's right. So this tells so the bright radio signal tells us that the electrons are there. Very high frequent, very high energy electrons are there. Right. You see the the um, the electrons re produce their energy in radio waves when they have very slight accelerations. So it's really when they collide with each other, which are fairly or with other um, particles in that region, it's very uh, low energy collisions. So mm -hmm. it produces low energy radiation. Nevertheless, the electrons themselves have high energy. And when they hit the surface, that's a high energy collision because they stop. They're actually going from near the speed of light to zero. So mm -hmm. that very great uh, deceleration causes not radio waves, but x-rays. It's basically light again, just like, I mean, both radio and x-rays are light type of light, but uh, the energy content of the light is different. Right. So if uh, one equivalent might be when we have a meteor that, that strikes the moon, we sometimes see a bright flash and people look for those. Right. So that's emitting a bunch of light that we, uh, that we detect that tells us what just struck the moon, but it's, it's not where all the energy is. It's just an indication right. of it. Mm -hmm. Or, or if you want to take the meteor analogy, when you see it flash through the, the atmosphere, it creates light, but that's not very much of the energy, right? It's when it hits the ground, that's when you release the energy. That's when you get a lot of energy. Yeah. yeah. And, and there are two forms you mentioned also the X ray. And, uh, here we do have, something that shows the the two and what happens with the flare let, let me before we go on with this these flares i mean they are things that we see uh in white light see especially well in hl but these are the things that many amateurs are used to seeing um, both from satellite images and ground images and and with their own hf telescopes so it is the same phenomenon that yes. that we're observing here so that's and, and what do we, what, uh, I think I know, but I want to be sure. So what do we get from the, watching the flare of the radio waves and the hard x-rays then? We're, we're getting a different part of that flare. We're getting uh, sort of to the core of what's really happening when the energy is, is being transferred. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if you... Uh... If you think about, I, I used to use the analogy like if you uh, are heating heating something up, you have some flame that is, uh, say, heating your pot of soup, and uh, you turn the flame off, and the pot of soup is still hot, and it takes some time to cool off. So the the flame is sort of what we're looking at. We're in the radio and the X-rays. We're looking at the the sort of the source of energy, and then that source of energy goes into heating, but the uh, extreme ultraviolet and the um, and the uh, uh, optical are more responding to the thermal aftermath so the sort of the hot soup that's slowly cooling mm -hmm. uh, so so what you see in the you know when you look say in H alpha with your telescope uh, you may see a flare going off and it takes maybe an hour to, to fully develop but um, most of the activity we see in the radio takes place only in the initial stages maybe uh, taking uh, a few minutes, uh, sometimes only seconds. So in a way, by the time you uh, see the flare happening in your H alpha telescope and watch it for a while, the main event's kind of already over. That's right. There's a lot of this, what's called the impulsive phase, uh, is, is well over by the time you see the most developed uh, optical flare. Okay, so we've got a graph here. I don't want to go through too much. I mean, we do see something that's familiar here that we looked at before that shows us these very fast, very high energy um, events. Uh, and, and we don't have gone over a little more technical stuff than usual, but it is uh, very interesting. So the high energy events here, because I was pointing at the wrong screen at the time. And here is the flare, but this flare, now this is the time. So this is this is a matter of minutes on this time scale. Yeah, now this is a much bigger flare than the other one. This is uh, this is called an X3 flare. So it's a, one of the larger flares of the um, current solar cycle. 
And uh, what I was pointing out here, this is only one frequency. This is just a time profile for one frequency. But uh, just comparing it with the hard X-ray time profile so that you can see a very high correspondence between the radio and the X-rays. Again, mm -hmm. they're produced by the same electrons and uh, just different phases of their lifetime, basically. Okay. Now, what about, you know, why do we want to look at these? Why, why are these interesting? I mean, they're fascinating to look at and see what's going on and be able to understand what's happening, observe what's happening in ways we can't do with, uh, with our eyes and with other telescopes uh, in other wavelengths. But how do they impact us on Earth? Well, um, so solar flares, uh, many of your listeners may be familiar with the general uh, impacts of solar flares, but they, they have many impacts, actually. Um, one of the things we discovered uh, in 2006, there was a, uh, a couple of events that we uh, discovered actually affect the global positioning system. Um, these bursts, um, we had a network of global positioning uh, stations around the earth that we were able to measure the effect, the direct effect of the radio emission from, from solar flares. And uh, we did see an effect, quite a strong effect. And then in December of 2006, there was a very large event. In fact, the largest one on record for radio emission. And um, that event actually caused uh, GPS systems all throughout the sunlit hemisphere, wherever the sun was shining, to lose their uh, navigation lock on the satellites. And the reason is because the sun was producing such a strong radio emission at exactly the same frequency as the GPS. So the satellites became invisible in this sea of noise from the sun. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's a flash, <clears throat> but it's a, a bright flash. It's like when somebody takes a flash, flash picture of you in right. that moment, you, you can't see anything but that flash because it's brighter than everything else. In this case, it happens to be in the radio frequency. Right, right. And this actually lasted for about 10 minutes. So there were some uh, systems that were dependent on very good navigation signals, uh, these, these dual frequency, very high precision systems. And uh, we did get reports of, of some of those uh, losing their navigation lock, and therefore they had to cease operations until it came back. So, mm. uh, no. Yeah. <clears throat> so, how long have we been monitoring these frequencies and and seeing flares happening at those frequencies? Well, um, this is the first time that uh, again that this was a discovery that we made in 2006. Uh, before that, we knew, of course, that solar flares were producing um, uh, noise at these frequencies, but we didn't understand that they could be so strong. So that was really a discovery at that time. Um, the one thing that has not been done that we hope to do with EOPS is to constantly observe the sun, at least when the sun is up for us, um, at a lot of frequencies. Because uh, you may have seen that some of the activity gets very bright in a narrow band of frequencies, but you don't, you can't predict where. So if you're observing a particular set of frequencies, quite often activity will happen in between where you're looking and you don't even know it. So uh, we've got a very wide range of frequencies, a very high time resolution, once per second we're measuring this. And again, we're making images of the whole sun, so we'll know where the emission is coming from. And sure. that combination is pretty unique. I mean, that's never been available before. So. So hopefully, eventually, this will lead to a model of what exactly what happens. So there might be some way of predicting it. It's sort of like predicting earthquakes. I mean, there's information someplace that would allow us to do that, but we don't have access to it yet. Right. Uh, so you're you're looking for trying to understand the process so we can know what's happening. Exactly, and and again, um, we can look with the uh, a lot of the traditional, you know, optical and and um, uh, ultraviolet radiations to look at what's really the aftermath and we can see the development over a long period of time but um, the trigger is the thing that is still pretty mysterious I and mean, we don't really understand how the sun produces such a strong uh, output of energy in such a short time it's really quite a quite a challenge physically to understand how it can do that well, so this mm -hmm. yeah, yeah go so ahead this, uh, the, the, the radio and x-ray observations are targeting that period of time. So these are, uh, we are familiar with uh, 
higher energy events uh, in extrasolar uh, systems, some other stars, even uh, galaxies that are exploding and quasars and so on. <clears throat> the sun is a relatively uh, weak source compared to things like that. Yeah. But apparently it's it's got the potential to really throw a, a strong one at us, uh, stronger than we realized. And, and when you get up yeah. into that kind of uh, uh, energy. Yeah. And I might say that a lot of the processes that are occurring in these super events uh, have an analog in the solar atmosphere. I mean, it's really, um, you know, there are only a, a small catalog of sources of energy, right? And one of the main ones is this um, magnetic energy. Mm. And so anywhere that magnetic energy is important, and it can be in uh, the quasars, it can be in pulsars, it can be in magnetars, you know, the, this magnetic energy is um, essentially at the core of of what's happening and so we can use the sun as a laboratory to study up close some of the same phenomena even though they don't occur to that extent in the sun they're still mm -hmm. the same same processes so it's it's only been since 1908 that we even knew that magnetic fields existed anywhere outside of the earth that found on the sun at mount wilson observatory which i have to put yes. in a plug for because i use yeah. those telescopes george ellery um, hale yeah. yeah absolutely a, a, a real milestone event and uh people had suspected it but uh it, it wasn't really known exactly how it worked it just sort of looked like a magnetic um uh phenomenon that's right. <clears throat> but uh, after that, we got the general magnetic field of the sun and then started detecting magnetic fields in other places. So apparently, just in just slightly over a century since we even detected magnetic fields, it's become really, really one of the primary processes in the universe for uh, transfer of energy at very high levels in very important ways. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so now the this adds a new, uh, well, it should, should we say hazard from the sun. We know flares are, are important, and we're always hearing now about how uh, solar flares in, in, with our very recent uh, dependence on satellites are going to do fairly terrible things and energy uh, distribution systems on Earth and that sometime there might, you know, we might lose uh, Facebook and Twitter, which <laughs> leads to, lead to worldwide chaos. It is. Yeah, so, so does this discovery and what you're seeing with the um, radio frequencies add a new dimension to that? Do these, do these turn out to be a little more dangerous than we thought? Yeah, you know, again, this is uh, something that happens every so often. I think uh, systems, it basically affects wireless systems that where the sun is competing with your radio signal from that, that you want to receive. And um, it, uh, we've demonstrated that this is happening with cell phones, typically at cell phone towers. So, you know, even worse than Facebook, you could lose your cell phone, you know, during one of these. Well, then you lose everything. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but um, uh, it, what one of the things that we've done is to look at this frequency dependence and see which frequencies are prone more than others and there are uh i think um technological ways of of building your wireless systems to avoid some of these problems or to be able to switch frequencies sort of uh, in real time and that sort of thing so um i think one of the things that we're doing is is uh Although we're, it's true we're discovering a new hazard, we may be pointing out ways or places where some um, improvements can be made, maybe make it less hazardous. Let's put it that way. Well, and what about uh, humans in space? Do, does this present, uh, you know, we've known about that for quite some time and there are ways of, uh, of uh, protecting humans who happen to be out there in shielded rooms and so on. Does this add something new to that dimension as well? Um, I mean, again, it, in terms of the radio noise, that's uh, that that is potentially an impact for communications between satellites, that sort of thing. Um, but I have to say that that in addition to the radio noise, of course, we're interested in the solar physics that is behind it, and uh, that uh, you know these high energy particles are one aspect. Um, they're some of them don't hit the surface, some of them escape the sun, and they 
those can be hazards to astronauts and to uh, technological systems in, in either around the Earth or, or between planets. Um, there are other kinds of things like uh, the coronal mass ejections themselves, which I guess we haven't even mentioned, but it's like a magnetic bubble that comes from, uh, you know, these active, active regions on the sun. And those things are bringing energy as a, you know, a little package of energy to the earth and releases it when, the, when that magnetic field bumps into the earth's magnetic field and causes auroras and things like that. So there's a lot of... Um, activity on the sun that do affect the earth and uh, we're you know studying not only those impacts but also the what leads up to the release of energy that causes those so, mm -hmm. so i have to ask then these do have a serious impact and uh in, in a lot of potential ways and the understanding what's going on there on the sun is important for a lot of systems, many of which are commercial, some of which are defense oriented. Uh, so who funds this? How is this getting going? And is this gonna be an expanding area in the future? Um, so our funding comes from both the National Science Foundation and NASA. Um, we also have a little bit of funding from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. So um, all of these agencies are interested in one aspect or another of of these impacts from the sun. Um, and uh, whether it will grow in the future, I mean, we all hope so, but uh, uh, one never knows uh, what the funding uh, situation is gonna, gonna be. Oh, um, yeah, um, I think that uh, if we really send astronauts to Mars, uh, it's gonna be a, a whole new level of uh, uh, concern about what the sun might do because uh, uh, down on Earth, we're protected by our magnetosphere, the magnetic field around the sun, our atmosphere. Uh, so even though we're so protected, we still have impacts. But if you're out in space <laughs> with none of that, uh, it really can be a dangerous situation. So. Now, uh, let's also, uh, you mentioned coronal mass ejections, CMEs, that people are used to seeing because they make absolutely spectacular events as observed from uh, on the sun usually from satellites and they cause auroras in our atmosphere these are primarily particles high speed particles part of the solar wind kind of a big burp of solar wind are they associated with what you're observing at all uh certainly they are um i let me correct you though that that okay. what what the chrome mass ejection fundamentally is is a packet of magnetic field and that magnetic mm -hmm. field runs into our magnetic field and the particles you see in the aurora are actually already in our magnetosphere. They're not from the sun. Those are particles that are coming down from the radiation belts or, or trapped particles, part of this interaction between this uh, cloud from the sun. So mm -hmm. most of the auroral particles are not actually solar particles, but nevertheless, they're precipitated because of this interaction of right. one magnetic field with the other. Right, right. So it certainly is um, the interaction with the two. So how's the magnetic field uh, transmitted then from the sun? This isn't just a large loop of magnetic uh, field. It, uh, magnetic field can actually pinch off essentially. So if you think about it as um, wires or, or strings or rope, uh, you can retie, you can cut and retie. And basically mm -hmm. that's called magnetic reconnection. And this process allows the magnetic field, it, it basically comes up from the surface, bulges out into these loops, and then can interact uh, due to motions in the surface and new flux coming up, it can interact with different flux systems. And part of that can actually leave the sun, become buoyant and leave the sun and, and reconnect behind it. And so it becomes essentially a bubble. There may be a connection back to the sun, but it's not energetically important because the thing is on the way it's leaving you know right, right. and uh, so this magnetic field then arrives at our magnetic field and if the magnetic fields are i don't know if people can see my fingers but if they're oriented oppositely then there can be a reconnection of earth's magnetic field here and the sun's here mm -hmm. and that causes uh you know energy to be transferred from the sun's influence to the earth's 
the magnetic bubble does it have particles within it that carry the magnetic field at all or there certainly are particles and the other thing that can happen is that the bubble itself can drive a shock and that shock oh. can accelerate the particles ahead of it so those particles really when you when you you know quite often there will be a flare and a cme and there will be some prompt particles that are you know very high radiation that makes it dangerous to be in space those particles are generally driven by the shock. I see. Okay. Well, that's a, a bit more complex situation than the, yeah. the usual. It just throws a bunch of stuff and, and it, that interacts with the stuff in our atmosphere. But uh, it's interesting. So this is the second day, the second time in two days we have heard about solar research happening uh, with the New Jersey Institute of Technology, which is not something we hear about a lot. Uh, those of us who have an interest in the solar stuff know it well. Uh, in terms of the facilities that are operating out here in California, you're back in New Jersey now. Tell us about the New Jersey Institute of Technology. It also operates Big Bear Solar Observatory. Um, took it over in a number of years ago uh, here in California. And why the interest in uh, the sol this solar research? Um, in fact, the uh, Owens Valley Solar Array, we're now working on the expanded one, but the original one was also transferred at the, exactly the same time as BBSO. So these mm -hmm. two observatories were transferred at the same time. I was at Caltech prior to this, and so I came to NJIT at that time, 1997. And uh, the reason was twofold. One is that Caltech was divesting themselves of these solar um, areas because their director of those um, observatories was retiring. So um, they had the option there of hiring a new director or or uh, shutting it down and going with something else. So um, at that time, um, someone by the name of uh, Hyman Wong had just been hired from Big Bear to NGIT. So it became a kind of a natural thing for NGIT to say, wait a minute, we'll take it. <laughs> You know, if you don't want it. Wow. So, uh, so uh, we took over those operations. And since then, of course, it's grown quite a bit. There's a new, uh, much bigger optical telescope at Big Bear. Uh, we've expanded our array uh, here at uh, Owens Valley. So uh, quite a bit of growth since then and uh, uh, definitely moving up to modernizing you know, to the latest technology. So tell, what else did New Jersey Institute of Technology was already there? Yeah. May not have had anything to do with solar research. I don't know. But what, what is this school primarily about? Because this, this happens to be all I know about it. Um, you know, the, um, the areas that were, uh, I mean, I should say that it used to be Co Newark College of Engineering. It's in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and that college was everything there was here until 1997, sorry, 1975, my mistake. And uh, in 1975, it became a, 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 a sort of a full service university. So there were added other colleges, including architecture and a school of management and, um, and the college that I'm part of, which is the College of uh, Science and Liberal Arts. Those were added to the engineering college. So mm -hmm. many people prior to 1975 are proud uh, alumni of NCE, which is the Newark College of Engineering. But, uh, uh, but now, you know, we're in JIT, the whole university. So um, there were there have been a lot of growth and changes since then, obviously. Um, and this solar, um, the solar observatories were kind of out of the blue. It wasn't really something that was planned, but uh, because of the circumstance of someone coming as a new professor here and having that tie, it seemed like a good opportunity. And so they jumped on it. And I think um, we now have a very strong physics department. It does material science. It does uh, optics. It does uh, biophysics. But uh, certainly the solar program is the largest component. And uh, we we uh, have a very uh, happy relationship with the university because we uh, were very successful and they appreciate it. So. <laughs> yeah. Is there still any involvement at all at Caltech? Yes, there is. Um, 
the mm -hmm. Big Bear is not so much, but uh, the the Owens Valley site is owned by Caltech, and so we're operating an instrument on the site there. Uh, but we have a lot of collaborations with uh, Caltech professors. In fact, I mentioned the large dishes uh, of our array are being used uh, for these faint, uh, you know, for calibration. But in fact, there is a program uh, called Starburst, which is really to look for solar analogs to, uh, sorry, stellar analogs to the sun. So they're looking for, it's, it's the same system in terms of the broad frequency range. Uh, and, the, and the high time resolution, but being able to use this high sensitivity to look for other stars producing these same kinds of events. Hmm. And uh, this, is, this is with Greg Hallinan, who's a professor at uh, Caltech. And so we have those kinds of uh, collaborations going on. Great, great. <clears throat> well, thanks very much for explaining to us everything that's going on uh, in these other frequencies and uh, not only the similarities which we're used to seeing uh, you know a lot of active areas on the sun we learned that there are other things going on at different different frequencies and they're analogous but uh, not always there are some things happening in other frequencies that we really have not looked at in all the time that we've been looking at the sun that uh, turn out to be very important so I uh, appreciate that. I'll have a uh, increased appreciation for those dishes when I'm driving up the Owens Valley again in the future for what's going on there. Now having some idea uh, what what's going on. So <clears throat> thanks very much for for joining us from your office there in New Jersey. I I will be landing in Newark uh, less than 24 hours from now. <laughs> so, oh, really? Yeah. And uh, I didn't even realize the uh, NJIT was in Newark, but. Uh, oh, okay. Well, if you have some time, you should visit. <laughs> yeah, one of these, I did, will definitely try to one of these days. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So uh, I, I will do that. And um, I want to thank everyone who has joined us and those who are watching uh, now on the archive on YouTube. This program will be available in the future as well. And maybe we'll get somebody to edit it so we can see the image that uh, we were talking about there for a while that, that I didn't bring up onto the screen. But I want to thank everybody for watching and for uh, recommending this to others if you think it was an interesting program as well. This has been the third of us in a series of uh, online uh, hangouts on air about solar observatories and what the research is doing. Some really pretty amazing things, I think. So hopefully the archive will be valuable in the future as well. Uh, all of this a part of Global Astronomy Month, which is every April, brought to you by Astronomers Without Borders. And so this was a real pleasure, and thanks to everybody who made this possible, especially Teresa bippert Plymate who uh, put these together and we hope to do more of this in the future. So for now, for uh, those who are watching and are watching on the archive, thanks again. And we uh, look forward to seeing you watching other programs as well. <laughs>